faithful God, you desire us to turn away from things that do not satisfy and find our fulfillment in you. Have patience with us. Tend and nurture our faith and make us bear the fruit of true conversion to the praise of your grace and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. With you. <coughs> the Lord appears to Moses on the mountain of God in the form of a burning bush. The Lord reveals his name, and he sends Moses, a fugitive, back to Egypt to lead his people to freedom. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I, am also, I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus shall you, you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read the uh, gradual psalm responsibly splitting at the asterisk. Oh God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore, I have gazed upon you in your holy place. That I might behold your power and your glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live. And lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed. And meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my helper. And under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast.
Paul warns believers that baptism will not excuse them from judgment if they fall into sin. But he also offers the reassurance that God will not allow them to be tempted beyond their strength. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. There were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders? than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Pray for you, Lord. Please be seated. I want to share a homily with you, and then I'll make a few comments further about it. It's entitled, Avoiding Complacency. Excitement abounds in our readings today. Something is about to happen. Yahweh is setting the stage. He sends for Moses and instructs him to go to Egypt and liberate his chosen people from their bondage. Immediately, Moses reminds God of his stuttering difficulty. We didn't hear that line in the reading, but it's in that 
full story. Yahweh tells Moses not to worry. He will feel any weaknesses that he might have. Moses asks his name and God responds, I am who I am. After all these years of silence, finally, God has a name. He has come to help lead his chosen people from their latest difficulty. With Moses' help, God will lead his people to a promised land and make a covenant with them. Moses begins to realize the significance of his mission. Like Abraham, Jacob, and the other deceased patriarchs, Yahweh would embrace Moses and his people and lead them to safety and security. In his strong letter to the church in Corinth, Paul admonishes the believers to remain steadfast in Christ and to Christ. They expected Christ's return to be imminent, but when it became obvious it was not to be, they became less committed. Their enthusiasm for Jesus' message waned. Paul reminded them not to be overconfident, as happened with the chosen people. Yahweh punished them for their wrongdoings. And the same can happen to the Corinthians. God desires faithfulness far more than sacrifice. Over the centuries, while God remained faithful to his promises, faithfulness failures plagued God's people. They often veered off the designated paths God chose and became lost in the darkness. Still, God forgave them and set their course accurately again. Christ's analogy of the fig tree is a fine example. And the writer of this homily says, In our yard, my father grew figs and vegetables. Sometimes his figs produced an abundant harvest, and at other times hardly a dozen. Like God, my father exhibited much patience, mercy, and yes, leniency when the yield was scanty. He demonstrated God's compassion for his creation. What he did best was include creation's need to be vigilant and merciful throughout the fig's growing journey. It happens that Christ's followers because of tedious repetitiveness, can fall into a false sense of security, which occurred with the Corinthians. While God's love and mercy are limitless and readily available for the asking, the scriptures show in both testaments that God has limits to his tolerance. When complacency sets in, we lose control, are listless, and relapse into lackadaisical behavior. Keep in mind the greatest saints could be heard whispering, there but for the grace of God go I. In the season of Lent that we find ourselves, we have opportunities given to us to be more, perhaps more truthful with ourselves and with God than we are in the rest of the year. We should always be truthful with God and with ourselves, but Lent sort of prods us and pushes us more in that direction. And I guess that the, the main concern that uh, struck me while I was preparing for today was the idea of God's mercy not being infinite, meaning that God's mercy is God's mercy. We have to reach out to receive it. You just can't presume that it's always going to be there because sooner or later, if we never respond, it's, you know, it's not going to be mercy for us. It's going to be 
something that we lost out on, a missed opportunity. That's what that complacency is all about. It's knowing that God, who is the tender of the, the fig tree, is willing to give us time. The mercy of God is extended for a time. God might be infinitely mercy in the, the most merciful in the theological sense, but also in the theological sense. He gives us the time we need, and if we choose not to take it, he's not going to force the issue. So we're here this morning because we believe that we need to be here and that we want to be here and that God needs us to be here and we want to be here because God wants us here. Chances are we won't have an experience like Moses in the, with the burning bush, that God will somehow reveal himself to us in some dramatic fashion. But we have offered to us all the time, but with special concentration in Lent, opportunities to have a closer encounter with this Lord of ours, with this God of ours. We have opportunities that many people don't take advantage of. If you are able to receive the texts on your cell phone that we have, that we send out every day during Lent, and you're not getting them right now, let us know. And we'll make sure that you get those little reflections every day on a scripture passage from the day that might help you in your journey towards Easter. We have the Eucharist celebrated every day of the week, but very few people take advantage of that. Some can't because of schedule or whatever, but those who can many times don't. Maybe they don't think of it or it's not really the thing that they want to be doing, but yet it's offered as a way to continue to grow in faith. And there's the Wednesday evening prayer with the reflection. And there is the opportunity, you know, for you to read the scripture on your own or at home. You can use the Book of Common Prayer, which you ought to have at home. And if you don't, you should make sure you get one. And talk to me, I'll make sure you get one. And in that Book of Common Prayer, there's a section called Daily Prayers for Families. And what's in there are very short versions of morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, and night prayer. So in two or three minutes alone or with others in the family, if you want to invite them and if they're willing, there can be this moment of prayer that you're turning your mind and heart to God and you might just be doing yourself a great favor and doing them a big favor of re being reminded of God's presence in your life. It may not be an issue for you. You may be attentive to, to the Lord's presence, but chances are with distractions, with work, with family, with you know, the, just the demands of everyday life, concerns about health, etc., that you know, turning for a few minutes to God might not be the first thing that pops into your mind. But yet, there he is, waiting to hear from us, giving us time to respond to his initiative, to his love, to his reaching out to us. And we may just take it for granted. And it's not always going to be that way for us. You know, the, the Lord is not in the business of condemning people. But his mercy, even though in one sense it's infinite, as I said earlier, is also temporary. 
He's infinitely merciful to those who want to receive that gift. But there are those who just sort of let it hang, don't bother with it, don't think about it. How many people there are who don't go to church ever because it's not anything they've ever done, or they just kind of presume that, you know, well, when I need God, God will be there. And what happens is they miss the opportunity to actually grow in a relationship with this God, like Moses had. Because Moses is described in the, in, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy as being this friend of God with whom God spoke like one friend speaks to another. He had that kind of a relationship, and Jesus makes it possible for us to have that same kind of relationship with God, him, with himself. After all, we're here this morning, and we could be someplace else. We're here this morning, and Christ comes to give himself to us in Holy Communion to remind us of the desire that he has to draw us more deeply into his life, and that hopefully the desire we have to draw him more deeply into our lives so that we can experience a little more this closeness to the Lord, this renewal and strengthening of our faith and giving us the courage to share that faith, to invite others in the family to, to pray, to be somehow or other willing to mention the name of God other than in a swear word. That we mention God, that we talk about our faith, that it's important enough to us to want to share it. We all have to face different situations and we have to make decisions on how we do things, how much time we have, what we're able to do because of limitations of health and circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the one thing we have to avoid doing is taking our faith so much for granted that we just sort of allow it to sit there and we don't do anything except maybe go to church on Sunday. And maybe we don't do that with any kind of consistency. And so the Lord calls you and me where we are right now to go more deeply into this life and relationship with him so that we can continuously be formed in his image and likeness because that's ultimately what God wants for us. All the good that we do, all the good that the church can do and does do and has done over the centuries, all of those things are marvelous in themselves. But ultimately, they need to flow from converted hearts and minds and try loving God and trying to demonstrate that love by, dem by loving others in our actions, our words, etc., cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, it's just do-goodism that anybody can do. But Christians ought to be doing it because we are impelled by the love of God in us and by the depth of our faith to want to put it into practice. And it just can help us to grow more in our own lives and to see the world around us within the four walls of our own home change and maybe giving us a little more peace of mind and heart, regardless of what we may be going through, that we have a greater trust in the one who has called us and whose baptism we have died and risen and who calls us to keep growing in his love and into his likeness.